This is Drive with Darren Hedge. That's life. That's life. That's what all the people say. You're riding high in April, shot down in May. As I was saying before I was so rudely interrupted, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's great to be back here on 3AW. It's even better to be alive. Thanks to an organ donor and his family, I have a new liver. And thanks to Bob Jones and his team, I have a new life. I'll talk about that later, but first, five months under house arrest. Five months. That's 153 days. That's more than 3,600 hours, or actually more than 13 million seconds. So what was it like? Well, I handled it. I didn't go stir crazy. I didn't get bored. Got used to the rules after being reprimanded for, in the first weeks for being 28 seconds uh, late back from the exercise yard. And for those of you who think, well, it wasn't really jail, was it? Just imagine having somebody knock at your door at 9.15pm for a random breath test and having to seek permission to go to the doctors or the dentist. The only excuse is permitted for me to leave my home. And wearing a cumbersome ankle bracelet from July 21 till it's cut off my leg at 1.29pm yesterday. Now, they call it home detention, which sounds like being kept in after school. But it was house arrest. It was house arrest. I was banned from sending emails, from giving interviews, from broadcasting, banned from earning a living. I was made a non-person. Magistrate Charles Rosenzweig said he wanted to make it as much like jail as he could, and he did. I was even banned from using Facebook, which I've since discovered has more than 100,000 names from people supporting my position over the suppression of the names of serial rapists and pedophiles, a campaign that will continue, and for that I thank you. And that's what this was all about. And it's weird. It's even ironic that while I was locked up, so much was happening on this issue. I guess if my name was Senator Darren Hinch, I would not have been convicted, not have been jailed, and not spent five months of my life locked up under house arrest. Because while I was gagged, Senator Nick Xenophon named a Catholic priest who had allegedly raped another Catholic priest. But Xenophon, of course, spoke under parliamentary privilege, so he was protected from any legal action. And Xenophon said he felt duty-bound to name the priest. The people in that parish, he said, had a right to know. Sound familiar? My wife, Chanel, who's been amazing through all of this, through the ill health and the house arrest, she echoed the Senator Hinch line, and she said it highlights the ludicrousness of the law currently in place in Victoria. And she's right. It is ludicrous. And to make it crazier... As I reached the halfway mark of my incarceration, the same Justice Department, which charged me and had me muzzled for so long, they went into court to try to have a suppression order lifted on one of Australia's worst pedophiles. You go figure. David Grace QC said the man had been allowed to make unsupervised visits in Ballarat and come to Melbourne, even though he's still regarded as an unacceptable risk to the community. And the lawyer said people had a right to know that this serial offender was, quote, in their midst. Hello? What have I been on about all this time? And in West Australia, the lower house has just passed a bill authorising the setting up of a public register for sex offenders. Something we must have have here in the state of Victoria, we must have it. Something that is in operation, without fear of vigilante attacks in the United States and in Britain. I'll give some examples of that after five o'clock. And in my weekly sessions with case managers from the Department of Corrections, they did their job. They tried to get me to pledge that I'd never, ever do such a thing again. And I pointed out, with respect, if seven High Court judges and other judges from the Supreme Court and the Magistrates Court had not convinced me that what I did was wrong, then they didn't have much of a show of doing it. And the scandalous facts are these. That under this new law brought in in 2009, which is worse than the one under which I was convicted, more and more of the worst sex offenders in history are anonymously out in your communities. It's called the Serious Sex Offenders Monitoring and Detention Act. I've changed the name and made the law worse. And even though it only applies to men who are likely to reoffend, it's now hard for the media to even report such cases. Often I've found out, since I was incarcerated, 
they are not even registered on the daily court list, and they are shades of a dictatorship. The courts are saying, the courts are saying that you, the mothers and fathers of young children, are not allowed to know why they are in court, and who these men are, or where they live, or what they look like. And in the first 18 months after this new law came in, the county court put 30 men under supervision orders. And you know how many of them had their names suppressed? 28. 28, with the county court virtually rubber-stamping them. Now, there are dozens of such men. Men have been released back in the Victorian community in recent years. Dozens more rapists and pedophiles in jail now and sued due for parole. They'll benefit from that anonymity. And I believe, I still believe, these men have no right to be able to go about their foul business under a cloak of court-sanctioned secrecy. And I believe they must be named. The campaign cannot end because too many children are still at risk. And if I put myself at risk again, well, that's life. Because these men, they move anonymously amongst you. Their identities are protected by the courts. A protection not given to murderers or to swindlers or to me. And these cunning predators use the anonymity as a weapon. Now, in a minute, I'll give you the sordid details of three of them. Three of the worst. You're entitled to know who they are and what they did. And one judge talked about the, and I quote, emotional and psychological effect on the respondent if material is published. Well, what about the victims, for God's sake? What about future victims? What about the emotional and psychological effects on them? That's why I believe that whenever released on parole, they must be on such a short leash, they have little opportunity to attack again. You not only deserve it, you should demand it. You should demand that such serial sex offenders be identified. And that's why I say the fight must go on, and from here it will go on. And as I walked, or I should say, as I shuffled into court to be sentenced on July 21, only two weeks after having a liver transplant, I was fighting for breath, and I couldn't say much. But I correctly suspected that I'd be banned from talking to the media on the courthouse steps after I was sentenced. But I did manage to say on the way in, this is a bad law, it will change. Maybe not in my lifetime, but it will happen. And now with my new liver, I'm now confident that I'll still be around when this mad and bad and dangerous law is dustbined forever. And if by giving up five months, if by giving up five months of my new life and five months of my freedom, if that helps change a bad law and that saves the innocence of even one child, then has it been worth it? My bloody oath it has. And if necessary, if an obscenely bad law does not change, I would do it again.